Hi everyone, I'm Sam Bakula and I'm here to talk about GraphQL. GraphQL was developed by engineers at Facebook in 2012, mainly with the goal of improving the performance of their Facebook mobile app. GraphQL comes from a simple idea. Instead of defining the structure of responses on the server, which we've done so far by writing RESTful routes, the client instead is given the flexibility to define exactly what data it wants in response to its queries. It caught on really fast and is now used by all of these companies and not just for mobile apps. Um, and there are different implementations of it for every major web language and different database management systems. GitHub actually documented their transition from REST to GraphQL really well with both blogs and videos. Um, so if you're curious about using GraphQL to manage endpoints for a really large API, definitely look, look that up. In this talk, we're going to focus on the performance considerations comparing graphs versus tables and GraphQL versus REST, because that can reveal some of the reasons why we would or would not want to use GraphQL. When I chose this topic, I had heard that this was the next big thing, but I also heard a few misconceptions. Some people would say, with GraphQL, you don't even need to know how a backend works. You don't even need to know the difference between a route and a model. You can just, it just does everything for you. I think that's not quite right. I even heard that the era of RESTful routing is over. And I don't stand through by either of these statements, but there's still good reason to be excited about GraphQL. So this is my roadmap. I'm going to cover some definitions. What is a graph? What is a query language? What problem does GraphQL help us solve? Then we'll go through some code examples, and then we'll return to this question. Final question is REST over. So what is a graph? A graph is a data structure consisting of nodes and edges that describe relationships among the nodes. And here we have a graph where there's three types of nodes. We have users, we have positions, and companies. And then we have all of these um, edges or the lines between them that, that indicate the relationships. And you can see um, these edges means that each node has a pointer to the next one. This is known as index-free adjacency. And if we're actually using a graph-based database, we don't search for related researchers resources by using a foreign key. We actually just have a direct pointer right to the next resource that we'll want to have. And this will provide a lot of performance advantages for us. However, GraphQL actually implements trees to create graph-like data traversals. And a tree is simply a type of graph uh, with a defined root node and no cycles. Um, so the tree just keeps on branching out without forming any interconnected closed chains. Um, so in GraphQL, we'll use a root query to find this root of the tree, that first, um, that first resource that we really want to access first. And then all of the related data will just traverse from there. So maybe we should actually be calling it TreeQL instead. But it turns out that GraphQL isn't exactly a query language either. Um, the QL in GraphQL just kind of indicates that it's a language used to make queries and databases, but it actually doesn't directly query your database. Um, so the name is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, it really only makes queries through your database management system. It doesn't actually directly do any um, make any connections with the raw database data. I suppose you could do that, but it doesn't give us any tools to do that particularly well. So that's not really how people use it. Um, so GraphQL really just operates over your existing code base and um, doesn't touch the raw database directly. Um, so fun fact, GraphQL is really a tree, and it isn't really a query language either. <laughs> so what problems does it help us solve? Uh, the first main problem is that many of our apps now have more deeply nested relationships than relationship, re relational databases were ever really meant to handle. Um, a graph is fundamentally a more natural data structure to represent, represent social networks than relational, re relational tables. Um, so for example, each Facebook user is a node. They're connected to other users and you know, the friends of their friends, um, content publishers, anything else that you can add or follow. Um, in order to branch out from a given node um, with a relational database like SQL, we're just performing all of these joins operations. And if, we're, if we think a lot of our data that's important to us in our app um, is captured by these, this network structure, then we're just performing way too many joins, and that gets pretty slow. Um, and it's not just um, things that we think of as social networking that has this type of structure. Um, you know, social networks are increasingly relevant to tons of products. Um, 
And here's the handy visualization of how joins are expensive. So in relational databases, joins are computed at query time by matching tables together by foreign keys. These operations are time and memory intensive and have an exponential cost. Um, so we end up creating pretty huge join tables, um, even though um, the two tables that they come from might be comparatively much smaller. And even if we're only interested in a few pieces of data um, from them. Graph databases, on the other hand, as we saw before, they have direct pointers from one node to the next, and we don't have to do any of this um, slow join stuff. Because GraphQL isn't actually a true graph database, it, rather it's a graph like wrapper around your existing database, um, some but not all of these advantages are preserved, uh, which I'll talk about a little more. The next problem that GraphQL, this was really um, what made Facebook decide to create it, is that mobile networks are slow. Um, and even when the network is strong, it can be interrupted by things like weather, or if the user's in a big building or an elevator. Um, and that really drives users crazy. If they're on your app, they think, you know, like you did something wrong as the engineer when, you know, they're actually just on a slow network. Um, so GraphQL uh, strives to provide the smallest possible play payload to the clients, and it does so by enabling the client to specify exactly what resources they want. REST, on the other hand, kind of defaults to send all of the related resources that they think um, a common user might want given that route, um, which makes, just makes the payload larger than it, um, than it necessarily has to be and can possibly overwhelm their network. So let's take a quick look at some example code. Um, so this is just what a request and a response written in GraphQL looks like. Um, so let's start with the request here on the left. So you'll notice that it looks basically just like a nested JavaScript object with all of the values missing. Um, so you just go through, you create your request. Up at the top, we have a user ID that acts as the root. Um, so we can have that root for our tree. Um, and then we just go through and specify each piece of data that we want. Um, and then the response, it looks very similar to the request. We just now have value pairs for everything that we asked for. Um, so there's a little bit more to that than you need to set up. One of the biggest parts of that is you need to create a schema um, for your GraphQL data that actually sits on top of the normal schema for your database. Um, so for this example, this is like, um, like our Juke app where we have lyrics that are connected to songs. Um, so we'll have most often the schema for our GraphQL um, server will look pretty similar to our actual database. Um, the only exception is if we have um, foreign keys because our GraphQL server will actually want to go out and grab, um, grab that resource rather than just having the foreign key there. So that's what this resolve function does. Um, so our lyrics, they have a song ID. So then we write this resolve function to tell us how to actually grab, grab a song. And that provides the edges of the graph that eliminates the need for a join table. So back to this question, is REST over? I'd say no. There's really no reason why we can't use them together. Um, you, I would recommend using GraphQL queries or implementing GraphQL whenever you have highly relational data. If you have all of these nodes, you know, like I said before, a lot of social data ends up being very um, node-driven or graph-driven. Um, it's also a good idea to use GraphQL queries whenever we aren't quite sure exactly what um, related data our user will want to get back, right? So this syntax is so flexible that um, our front end can really be asking um, very particularly. So here um, we see with this query, so this user has all these friends, but we're really only interested in the first five friend connections because maybe that's all we're going to display in our browser, right? We don't need all 700. Um, so it allows the user to be much more particular about what they want versus, you know, in a, um, in a RESTful route, we would probably end up getting all of those um, friends back and then just doing nothing with the majority of the data. Um, so maybe we're early in our app design. We're not exactly sure um, all the routes that we want. Again, if we just use GraphQL, it's super flexible. Um, it kind of replaces tons of different app endpoints that we might make. And let me go back to my other slide. Um, and also, if you're designing a huge API like GitHub, 
and you think your clients have a lot of needs that you're not going to be able to anticipate perfectly, um, um, then just use GraphQL because we don't have to create all of these routes to determine what exact resources they should have access to. We can just set up GraphQL and let them um, make their own queries. And that is it. Thank you.